Yo, what's up everybody, it's your boy Jed here, and we've covered action games numerous times on this channel, whether games like Stellar Blade or Spider-Man 2, and the game I'm going to be talking about today is Onichanbar Origin, a remake and reimagining of the first two Onichanbar games, as well as their latest release of D3 Publisher's 2004 PS2 franchise, Onichanbar. Without further ado, let's talk about it, shall we? Ona Chanbara is a hack and slash zombie killing franchise developed by Tamsoft, released back in 2004 and known in the EU as Zombie Zone, but never released over in America. The sequel, Ona Chanbara 2, however, was initially only released in Japan, until both games got an updated version that both released over in the EU, known as Zombie Hunters 1 and 2. Since then, the franchise has gotten multiple games over the years, with many coming over to America. However, with the strange habit of constantly jumping consoles every other entry, but we're not going to talk about that. Now that you have a bit of an understanding of this franchise, let's get started with the remake. <laughs> After starting the game, we get a cutscene where we're introduced to Haya, the game's main character. Now she's searching for her missing half sister Sasaki, as well as her father, Obero. While searching, she meets an informant named Ray and makes a deal with her that she would help Aya find her family, but help hunt undead in return. A long time passes, and with no cell of lead, Aya is just about ready to give up. However, while at her mother's grave, she would receive a message from Saki that reads, Die, won't you, for mom's sake. However, after reading the message, she gets attacked by undead, so she fights them off. To fighting them off, she gets the call from Ray, who asks how the search for her sister is going, and whether or not she's at the graveyard. She informs her that she's there and that her mother's body was taken from her grave. She tells her that Saki may be trying to bring her back to life. Upon hearing this, Ray tells Aya that she may have a lead on Saki's whereabouts, and informs Aya that someone saw a girl in a school uniform at a shutdown hospital nearby. So Aya goes to check it out, over on the way there, she gets stopped and attacked by more undead. So she takes them out, and immediately after attacking them, she gets attacked by a huge undead. However, due to, during the fight, due to her baneful blood, it begins to act up as she's covered in blood during the fight, causing her to go berserk. After defeating the big undead, her baneful blood calms down and she goes back to normal. After being informed by Ray that she installed a shop app on her phone, continues to the hospital and learns that the elevator is stuck on the third floor. Eventually, she makes her way to a part of the facility and there she learns that the hospital is run by an organization known as Uroboros, and that they use the place to run experiments, but an accident caused the place to be destroyed. After going up the elevator, in the room, she runs into a young undead girl who says she was ordered to kill Aya and attacks her. However, before Aya can deal the final blow, the building begins to shake and the girl runs away, seemingly calling out for her sissy. And Aya goes after her, eventually following her to the roof. When she gets there, she runs into another undead girl, Sayaka, who proclaims herself as the older sister of Anzu, the girl from before, who is also there and they attack her. However, midway through the fight, Sayaka saves Anzu by throwing her off the roof and continuing to fight Aya alone. She dies and Aya gives her a prayer. Afterwards, Ray calls to tell her that she's gonna come pick up the body and Aya continues on her way back down from the roof, eventually finding herself in the basement only to be met with a pile of bodies and eventually running into her father, whose own baneful blood is making him go insane in his thirst for vengeance and avenging his wife and Aya's stepmother, Subaki. As a result of his own insane state, he attacks Aya, believing her to be Ava, the woman who did kill his wife. During the fight, Aya's body begins to burn as a result of the mental and physical trauma she's received during the fight and enters ecstasy form, a demonic looking transformation specific to those with baneful blood that hide their strength well beyond that of their berserk state. Whoever comes with the downside that you run the risk of going insane, getting lost in the ecstasy they derive from the violence and bloodshed. Fighting off his own insanity and temporarily coming back to his senses, Obero apologizes to both Aya and Saki, causing Aya to realize she'd almost lost her mind and resolved to stop her father, which she succeeds in doing, bringing him back to his senses and causing him to come back to reality long enough to explain himself. He reveals not only that Saki is being manipulated by Ava, the woman who did kill her mother, but that Saki isn't her half-sister, but actually her full-blooded sister. And the reason their parents lied and hid that is because it's the fated tradition for blood-related sisters of the same baneful blood to end up fighting to the death and killing each other, and they didn't want that for them. After learning this, Aya continues on her path to Saki, even taking Kobro's dual swords with her, and eventually she reaches her, where the two begin to fight, even transforming into their respective ecstasy forms. However, Aya is still able to get Saki to listen to reason and gets her to see the truth of her situation. The two then go to visit their mother's grave before setting out to find their father. 
And this is where the game stops with its adaptation of the first game story. So I want to take a second to cover how it adapts the first game story because it does so very well. In fact, I'd argue it does so even better than the first game. In the first game, every mission starts with a dialogue text scroll by Aya that explains what led her to this point, whereas in this game, you get proper cutscenes to explain everything and transition from one to the next. The game does start out with a text scroll as we're a bit of ways into Aya's journey, but after that, you don't get another one, and I'm okay with that. So it's just a nice callback to the original and is really unnecessary afterwards. They also flesh out Overwatch's character much more in this game as opposed to the first, mainly seeing as how they actually give him a name as he went unnamed in the original and this continues throughout the whole game. And I love that because Obro is genuinely entertaining as a character. Hell, this whole sequence with Obro is pretty much entirely original to this game. This doesn't happen in the first game, the exception of the boss fight. He does have a boss fight in the first game, but the game never makes it clear that it was him. Saki does tell Aya that when Obro showed up, he was killed by her and turned into a zombie. Remember, that's really all the info you get. Unless you look it up, you would never know that this specific zombie that you fight is Obro. Another thing new to this game is the fact that Saki survives the encounter with Aya. Well, it's revealed she survived the second game. In the first game, she was struck down by Aya. Whereas in this, she's able to calm her down without having to strike her down. I I actually quite like, especially the dialogue during both the fight and afterwards. It adds more details to her falling so easily into Ava's plot to manipulate decisions into killing one another. They also add more detail to Anzu and Saika, the two zombie girls and their whole story, making them feel even more like proper characters as opposed to just recovering bosses in the games, taking them from the physical manifestation of the grudge of two girls who died and were reanimated by Saki into a proper pair of baneful blood sisters with a tragic past as just like Aya and Saki were meant to, they fought to the death with Anzu killing her older sister who were eventually dying an unknown death. And when they were reanimated, Anzu doesn't even remember what happened in their past other than Saika being her older sister. But Saika remembers everything, which is part of why she's so quick to sacrifice herself to keep Anzu safe when she realized that I is stronger than both of them and is ultimately going to kill them both. Add so much detail to all the characters who play a role in the first game story, and all the changes they make only serves to improve things for the better. But that's what the game changes story-wise in regards to Onichan Bar 1, so let's go back and continue with the game's adaptation of the second part of the game and its adaptation of Onichan Bar 2. The adaptation of Onichan Bar 2 starts a few days into their search for their father, when they soon get sighted of him but are attacked by a mysterious woman who reveals herself to be Rei and helps the sisters on their journey to find their father. They eventually catch him in a shopping mall but lose him again as he enters a portal and proceed to go after him, eventually running into Anzu who wants to fight Aya again and get revenge for her big sister's death, however Saki steps up to fight her and kills her. After her death, a portal appears similar to the one Obero went into, so the girls decide to enter it while Rei stays behind before being approached by a girl who looks almost exactly like her. As the two girls exit the portal, Obero meets with Ava and fights her. As the two continue their pursuit of their father, Aya gets a call from Rei who tells her that she's gonna take charge of her own destiny as a result of being inspired by Aya managing to save Saki and keep from killing her. In a somewhat obsessive and near maddening tone, the two sisters decide to press on, noticing that Rei seems off but hoping to be wrong and continue onwards before running into multiple girls who look like Rei. It's then that Rei informs him that these girls are all clones, including her, making it clear she's going to destroy all of the clones, as there only needs to be one Rei before ending the call, leaving the two concerned for her but they have to carry on anyway, and eventually they catch up to their father, who asks them to kill him for going completely insane and attacking them, however the two are able to stop and slay him, bring him back to reality before he eventually dies. The two grieve for a moment before carrying on with their journey to defeat Ava at their father's request, and it doesn't take long for them to find her. After defeating her, Rey shows up and rips her heart out, before throwing her body into the ocean and shooting her in the head. Rey, in her then manic state, begins monologuing to herself about how she had finally managed to completely kill all of the clones and destroy the organization that made her, for devouring Ava's heart and going completely sane as she wants to literally be Aya. She then attacks the sisters in her insanity, however the two are able to stop her and kill her. Aya comforts Rei in her final moments where she too dies. The two sisters then go to place their father's sword beside their mother's grave, honoring him in a way before going on with their journey together, and the game ends.
just like with the first half, adapting the first game, the second half does a very good job of adapting the second game, starting with Ai and Saki searching for their father before running into Rei, as opposed to the second game, which starts with Reiko running into an unconscious Saki going on a bit of a mindless rampage. They also play on Saki and Reiko not having a particularly positive relationship. There's not much done with it in the original other than establishing the point that they don't get along well. In this interpretation, Rei actively antagonizes Saki, even going as far as to constantly call her Dear Saki, the same thing Ava used to call her, and Saki actively constantly argues with Rei in return, constantly calling her a bitch and so on. Rei's relationship with Aya also has more detail where instead of having a relationship with Reiko and Aya, where they are more like reluctant co-workers when they work together. Ray's relationship with Aya in this game is that of genuine friends. They genuinely do care for one another. Ray even flat out admires Aya for how powerful she is and being the first person in her life who genuinely cared for her. And when she goes insane, that admiration for wanting to be like Aya straight up turns into wanting to be Aya. That's how much Aya means to Ray. They also pull things in from later games such as her questioning or borrows the game's interpretation interpretation of the organization that created Rei. How only one of the details that I don't like is how Rei appears seemingly out of nowhere at the end to kill Ava. When the original Reiko showed up before the fight started, you see her show up and she canonically assists in the fight, so it made sense she was there to immediately kill Ava and devour her heart, just like she did in this game. Whereas in this game, however, she goes off to do her own thing and doesn't show up again until after the fight is over. The other thing is her name, because her name in the game isn't Ray, like I keep calling her. It's Lei. I'm like, I get why. So it's the planner clone number, which is 137, and she got the name Lei from seeing her clone number upside down. But the reason it annoys me is because A, the character she's supposed to be an interpretation of is Rayco, but the game constantly calls her Ray. Your friendly informant Ray right here. Ray, you're going to bury her? You're. Ray? I still can't believe Ray is a clone. I was contacted by an informant named Ray. Her name is Ray. Fucking commit to it dead. Like, I get the whole symbolic number thing, but it's so not fucking necessary. She's already well written and entertaining enough, and the DLC missions add to that even more. I'll touch on that later. You don't need the whole number symbolism thing. <sighs> Mini rant over on more good shit. Oh, bro! They give him much more present than first another game unlike the original where he doesn't appear at all and this half of the game you see him in his berserk state he even gets another original boss fight pretty much every sequence with obro is completely original to this game it's great they make him feel like more of a character and that actually kind of hit because you get to see just how much he cared for his daughters he drove himself to the point of literal insanity in an attempt to play hero for them which led to them having to kill him to free him from his own insanity W dad, bro. W dad. They even gave him a whole original scene with Ava, the main antagonist of this half of the game. Also, this game's handling of Ava is really nice as well. It does everything the original does, but much like with the zombie sisters, they add to it a lot in giving her multiple original sequences, showing just how it twisted her mind is as a result of her baneful blood. Speaking of Anzu and Sayaka, the fight in the mall doesn't actually happen in the parking lot with just Anzu. It instead happens in the front of the store with both sisters. The great bit of adding continuity to things. As during the hospital fight, only Sayaka dies, leaving Anzu to fight alone. Whereas in the first game, they both died and then were resurrected, leading to the mall fight. The game's retelling the original two under Tumbar game stories is great as it retells everything as it is, adding details to it and altering the sequences a little to make things flow better as one consistent story, fleshing out the characters more and making everything better for it. Also, the voice acting for the game is really good. All the voices of the characters fit and are very well performed. The only thing I really don't like is the syncing because the voices are so poorly synced to the models and it's so bad. Like once you notice it, you will never unnotice it. I'm gonna play you a few examples just to show you how bad it is. It's about time, Aya. I heard he messed with my sister here. Aya. Sakiwa. Imoto ga sewa ni natta so da na. I'm sure you don't remember me at all. <laughs> I've been chasing after the one who killed Tsubaki all this time. And I've finally found her. I've been chasing after the one who killed Tsubaki all this time. 
そしてついに見つけたんだ<笑> Now I'm the only one It's just me I'm finally the origin I am finally alone at last <笑>一人に私は私はオリジンになれたのよこれでやっとたった一人になれたのに Yeah it's bad really bad like Xenoblade Chronicles 2 levels of bad if you do decide to check out this game do yourself a favor and play with the Japanese voices with that though I believe we're gonna finally move on from the story to the gameplay the game is a hack and slash action based game in a style similar to DMC or Bayonetta but a lot more bloody almost like OG God of War but due to the anime-esque aesthetic and the freeform openness of it all it also ends up having a similar style to another Tamesoft franchise that I love Senran Kagura and this is also due to being very Musou-esque and that's kind Kind of the best way to describe this game. It's got similar combat to the OG Omni Shambara games with the core hack and slash style like DMT or Bayonetta, combined with the open, freeform Musou style combat that the Omni Shambara Z games had similar to that of Senran Kagura. The game's level design and redesigning of the areas you traverse through in the first three, two games is amazing, as they're far more streamlined and much easier to go through this time around, whereas in the first two games they were very amazing like and it was very easy to get lost. While there was a lot of exploring to be done in the first two games, they were also far too heavy on the backtrack and due to the way the mini Map and camera work, it was far too easy to get lost. Hell, the first game didn't even have camera control, which is fucking terrible for a game that involves fighting large groups of enemies. This game improves on that and all, keeping the camera control from later games and making it easier to tell where to go while removing a lot of the backtracking. And while sadly the exploration was lost as a result, it's ultimately far more worth it if it means it's easier to get to the damn game. The game also reworked the bloodlust mechanics in the OG games, keeping the basic layer of it where the more blood you get spattered with as you fight, the greater this meter around your character icon fills. And when it maxes out, you'll enter Berserk State, which gives you a huge buff to damage and speed, but constantly drains your health. Hoover Origin introduces Ecstasy Mode, a second level to it that completely changes the character's appearance and basically takes every aspect of Berserk Mode and cranks it up to 10, including the health drain. And these levels You will eventually run out, so it's not hard to survive and keep going, as opposed to the original games, where once you enter Berserk State, you're pretty much stuck like that until the game drains too much of your health and you die. Origin adds a much needed change to this system, and more an adaptation of Z's version of this system. They streamlined a lot of the systems in this game, really, like making the shop accessible at any time. They also give you the option to change various、uh, features at various times, including centering the blood to white. Just don't. It looks so weird. It looks like straight nuts. <laughs> like straight Matrix juice just busting out of these zombies. It looks so weird. Especially because it splatters on the screen. Weird white blood aside, the game's playable characters also all play very differently. As to the first game, which had Aya as its only playable character, the updated version Zombie Hunters featuring Riho Futaba, as well as her younger sister Makoto from the D3 series Simple. Which all played pretty much exactly the same. Then the second game, which started out with Reiko and Riko, and the full roster consisted of those two Makoto, Aya, Saki, as well as Kiko and Hana from another D3 series called Dragon Sisters.、And、even though you play as the game's main antagonist, Ava, this game really has three playable characters, just like the first game, starting out with Aya, and when you beat the first half, you unlock Saki as a playable character, both of which play incredibly differently. Aya's gameplay being swifter and smoother with less range, meanwhile, Saki has a large katana and gloves that allow for hand to hand combat. Future attacks that aren't as smooth and swift as Aya's, but have more range and generally hit way harder. The game's third character is Rei, and there are two ways you can unlock her. First is through Infinite Tower, which is basically the game's equivalent to Buddy Plaza from DMC, which taps out at 50 levels, but in order to get her, you need to complete 150 levels, which seems impossible because it's three times that, but it's actually not as the way the game works, is after you beat stage 50, the game will reset to a harder level of floor 1, which the game then counts as floor 51, a harder version of floor 2, which counts as floor 52, and so on and so forth. Basically, you need to do three whole rounds. Runs of Infinite Tower, and you have to do it in one go. Because if you ever die or quit, your only option is to start over from the beginning. 
the second option is spend money and buy her for four dollars the only reason i bought her is because 150 levels of infinite power is far too time consuming especially with the mass amount of enemies that throw your way the way she plays with a knife she used to slice enemies a series of guns she can use to shoot at enemies similar to she did in the original however she's not affected by the berserk system the same way i and saki were but the way they reworked around this was to give her a limited buff through reworking her reload the reload system is just the game's way of clearing off blood from your weapon is when you attack the blood will cover your weapon making it harder to use unless you reload Ray's, however as her reload putting her it back into her knife into the box on her back which carries her guns as well and cleaning the knife off but putting it in there over the blood from the knife fills up the box when you switch to her gun when it's filled up her shots have more range and power she even gets this super powerful laser shot which you can charge up it's not that nice it's also a nice change and a good way to allow her to keep up because instead of getting a new form that powers her up her weapon gets the power up yo editing jet here and quick little editor's note ray actually does have a berserk form but you won't be able to access it properly in normal gameplay because even if you manage to max out her gauge you won't trigger the transformation the bloodless gauge just won't increase anymore <laughs> it seems you can only access it in training mode which kind of sucks it would be cool if you could actually access it in normal fucking gameplay maybe you can I don't know. As from what I've found, it seems you can only access her transformation in training mode. Just wanted to add the little addendum. Back to past jet, I'm gone. Admittedly, I do wish they brought back Riha as she was playing in the first two games, or even letting you play as Ava like the second game did. I don't understand why they didn't, as outside of Ava, none of them really matter to the story, but it would have been a really nice addition, especially with how differently they all played in the second game. Hell, it would've been cool if they added the OG D3 guest characters or even Ava's like DLC for a similar place to Ray. Hell, they could've maybe implemented them in pairs. Speaking of DLC though, this game does have DLC, which most notably adds new bonus missions that add a lot of story detail. Two missions for Aya that take place before the story, which focus on Obro training her before he disappears. Two for Saki, which showcases what she saw and how Ava manipulated her weak and vulnerable heart against her father and sister. And not one, not two, but six missions for Rey. The first three showcase her events before the main story, and the final three take place during her disappearance after the fight between Saki and Anju, showing her slowly going insane like we see her during the main game, showing what she went through that led her to the point of complete mind-broken insanity she is by the end of the game when she reappears. It's great and it adds so much detail to this version of the lore and story, it's wonderful. The DLC also adds new costumes which were originally an unlockable thing but in this game are dlc though they are very cheap it would be nice to have them on cool again the costumes are very well designed and look cool as hell with callbacks to other d3 publisher games like the dream hostess outfit or ray having a biker uniform reminiscent of reiko's outfit in the og games also saki has a gi and one of the alternate colors for it is orange and blue and you can't tell me it wasn't inspired by goku it's literally called dragon orange for fuck's sake <laughs> Also, I remember how I compared this game to Senran earlier in its gameplay style? Well... The physics definitely don't help with the comparison. Another thing that doesn't help with the comparison is the music, as this game's soundtrack, as well as the majority of the old game's OST, is composed by Akihi Motoyama, the composer for a large amount of the Senran Kaga franchise. You can feel that. How? I just hit my fucking microphone. I would play some of the music for you, because the music in this game fucks. But this video is going on long enough, so if you want to hear it, look it up. I've been playing a lot of it in the background. I'm moving on. Crest returns from the series, and they're just extra objectives you can play throughout the game simply by playing. Get a certain amount of cool finishes, get a certain amount of cool combos, get a certain amount of enemies and ecstasy and so on. And getting the DLC adds new quest rewards and whatnot, and the rewards for the quest include artwork and different things, character sheets, even these three dope as artworks of Ayo, Saki, and Rei. The only downside to it all is the lack of multiplayer because multiplayer to other games that actually do have it is actually really fun. So I would love if they added multiplayer like the Z games or Untumbar Vortex. But all there really is to talk about about this game. It is an amazing game, being a perfect remake of the first two games that improved on everything that made the original games great, while keeping the things that made those games great intact and building around them. It has a fun and poppy art style to it, and as an anniversary game, it's a wondrous f bleh, the wonderful way to celebrate the release of the first two franchises and the first two games in the franchise, with the only downside being the lack of multiplayer. I would absolutely love them for remakes some of the other games this style, like Onishin Bar Revolution. Maybe they could remake the Z games in this style and actually port the first game or fucking english in some goddamn form so much they can do with this content as a whole 
because there's so much content to work with honestly a whole origin universe would be pretty damn cool this is one of the dopest remakes ever made this is how you remake a game and this is how you do a fucking anniversary but with that said this video has been going on for long enough i'm not even gonna be on my usual spiel i'm out peace out and enjoy yourself Die!